Oh, yeah, I saw some blue. I saw some blue. It should be good to go. Okay, uh, so let's start with this slide. It's a bit better. My name is Justin Yancey. Uh, I will be talking today about uh, web automation, in particular with uh, Invoke Web Requests and how it can change your life. I am originally from Australia. It's where I think most of my accent is from. Uh, this one's for the locals. I lived in Sweden for a year. Uh, we just had some light stuff. Turn it down. Off. Oh. No. Stop light. All right. I'll just uh, continue on. And can everyone see the board still? Okay. Cool. Uh, I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I lived for a year in Sweden, in Swedish. Um, <clears throat> Moved to London in 2011 and recently moved to Seattle, joined the land of opportunity. Um, I'm an automation specialist by trade. I've been working with um, automation tools for all, all my career pretty much. Um, I started off, my first proper IT job was in information security, which is what I thought my dream would be. Um, and I was a graduate at a bank and they started giving me all this really, really, really boring work. And I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I started getting into automation and uh, I've never really looked back. Um, so yeah, so I, I've exp uh, experienced working in uh, BMC's Atrium Orchestrator, uh, System Center Orchestrator, uh, Cisco's Process Orchestrator, BizTalk, all of these kinds of tools. And in the end, um, when those tools can't do the things, you end up just calling the PowerShell adapter. Um, and that just sort of bridges the gap and after a while I started asking yes. Keep going. After a while I started asking the question, why bother with all of these other things when PowerShell can just do everything you need to? Um, and so that, that's kind of where I've been going now. Uh, in particular writing platforms to execute PowerShell on uh, distributed execution yeah, yeah. platforms. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Alright. Great, great. So that's that's kinda a background about me, so I'll move Justin, on. Are you on Twitter? Am I on Tinder? Did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, my ears. Got to good speak to the good ear. Um, no. Uh, yes. Yes, I am. Uh, yes. Uh, it's uh, at DevOps Machine. Uh, that's me. <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, okay. So, what will we cover today? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about moist, uh, a moist, dirty hack. This, this demo, the demo I'm going to do today is, um, is a dirty hack. I put in the word moist there because dirty hacks, uh, while they tend to carry these negative connotations about the word dirty hacks, sometimes you just need to do a dirty hack to get the job done um, because oftentimes people build software and they don't think about programmatic interfaces, APIs, things like that. They just think... The user is only going to do it this one way, so I'm only going to build this system to support that one way. So when you then get given the task to automate this system, you're kind of like left with not much to do other than a dirty hack. Um, but that dirty hack is still the way to go. So like the word moist has some d uh, dodgy connotations with it, as does dirty hacks. So um, <clears throat> So yeah, so it's, it is a dirty hack, but it's still like is in production and it works fine. Um, so yes, things that you can do with it. Um, the the demo that I'll be giving today is um, on um, resetting a Wi-Fi password. So we had a requirement saying we want a new Wi-Fi password every day, and this tool was not written with an API. Um, so this required an administrator to log into the system every day, reset the password, and send out an email to people. Um, and that doesn't really work, um, like, cause people will forget and then the whole system breaks and then you've got angry customers who want to connect to Wi-Fi, but they don't because it hasn't <laughs> happened. So, uh, this thing comes along, but in addition to that, like it can be just for personal things. I would say most of the web automation I've done is actually not to do with work. So things like, uh, I wrote a script that would, uh, there's a restaurant called Noma in Copenhagen. It's like world's number one restaurant. Uh, I wrote a script that would um, hit their website every 10 minutes and scan their calendar to see if they had any availabilities. Um, so it would send me an email when there was a, an availability there. Uh, automating timesheets, I'm sure everyone has to do timesheets. Um, that's the first thing you want to get rid of in your job. Um, 
and and you know th a bunch of things like that, um, and that's why it's um, this this thing can can re that's why I say you know, how how it can change your life, because it can take away those boring things like logging in and changing a password or doing your timesheet and just give you more room to do the things that you find interesting, like automating those processes. Did you um, see that Noah? I did, yes. <laughs> uh, my thing emailed me, and, uh, and I got in in time, so it was, uh, it was very cool. Uh, all right, so two commandments for web automation. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is invoke web request. Uh, invoke rest method is that ideal world um, commandlet where everyone implements a rest interface and returns to you nice JSON or XML and things like that, but um, most websites don't. Um, so invoke web request is, is what you end up using. So interacting with APIs, but I'll get into that a bit later. Um, <clears throat> so then um, the four key stages of what I'm gonna call a user journey. Uh, this is actually an official term, but I'm going to do this because um, it sounds fishy or fancy. Um, <clears throat> SCOM has this, but um, again, SCOM is, is sort of very limited in its journey capability. Uh, and just kind of what, what you're doing when you're doing web automation. Uh, go over a quick couple of gotchas with SSL certificates that you're going to encounter because we don't live in an ideal world where every website uses a properly signed and trusted certificate. Um, and an overview of how to use Fiddler for uh, creating your uh, user journeys. Uh, so yeah, so going into the commandlets now. Invoke web request. This is for the, the generic uh, web request that you're going to do where you don't know what your response is going to be. And this is basically the same thing that your browser does. It just sends an HTTP GET or a POST or whatever you tell it to send um, <clears throat> and it will return back the data as well as headers and status codes and all of those things. Um, invoke REST method is um, kind of, uh, well, if we drop down to the bottom there, it's kind of like running invoke web request, select, expand property content, convert to JSON, um, it pretty much does that for you. So if you're dealing with something like Azure and you're interacting with those APIs, you use invoke rest method because that one's going to predictably give you JSON responses so you don't need to worry about parsing and doing all of that stuff. So you can save yourself some lines of code uh, there. So, so these two, nice one, dirty hack one. All right, so going into the next part, uh, I'm going to describe uh, what's good, yeah, the, the user journey concept. Um, and this is basically what happens when um, you have a task you want to automate um, the process that's involved. And you can typically break it, in, break it down um, into four steps. So your initial request is what you need to send to the website. It'll be just the, the page that has the login. You need to send this request because a bunch of things happen when you first hit that <coughs> web page. Um, it establishes a cookie container um, inside what's called a web session object. So we'll be able to, to go into and see that, that in code a bit later. Um, and yeah, so and, and it'll uh, fill up all the headers that you need. So the accept encoding, accept um, compression types and stuff like that. So, so you do that, that first hit. Then you've got, so you've got your cookie containers and all of that. Then your authentication step. Um, this will be typically uh, forms-based authentication when you're doing web automation. Um, it, it's nice and easy when it's AD auth because you don't have to do any of this, um, but mostly forms-based stuff. So <clears throat> this will be, usually there's two ways that this uh, websites will, um, will implement authentication. Uh, one will either be in cookies, uh, the other one will be in an authorization token inside the, the headers. So um, you can use Fiddler to figure out which one it is, which I'll show you um, a bit later. So yeah, so you go here uh, with your session cookies and you um, just send, post your user information um, to that and that will redirect you to the dashboard page or whatever it is there. And then your next step will be identifying the object you want to do something with. So you might, that might mean you, you hit another URI because you're authenticated, you go to another thing and then you need to pass through the web page to try and find what it is that you're, you want to make the either uh, create. So you might want to find the form that you want to post to to create an object, or you want to find something that you want to edit and update or delete. And then the action, which is the edit, uh, update, create or delete um, thing that you want to do. And you can break down pretty much any process uh, into these things. Uh, just quickly talk about certificates. Uh, when people use self-signed certificates, um, that 
thing that pops up in your browser saying this is not secure, do you want to continue? Um, PowerShell does its own thing there. Um, well, actually, .NET does its own thing, which PowerShell pushes up the stack. Um, and it just spews um, <coughs> saying uh, channel error or something, could not, server closed connection. There's two ways that you can usually get around this. This one's the easiest one, and it's one line of code. Um, you can just put that in there, and it works about half the time. I don't know why. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's the first thing to try because it's a very simple one line of code, and you're just editing the, the service point manager attribute in .NET. Um, if that doesn't work, um, then this way works. Um, I say to use this one because this one is, is a lot larger overhead because you have to Sorry, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, sorry, 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 Jason. I was just going to say that top method. Yeah, I've seen it work half time, but isn't that machine wide as well? I think if you change that, it changes the. It's the app domain wide in .NET, domain. so it's not machine, but whatever's in your app domain. Yeah. Um, so, which hopefully most things in PowerShell won't be, but if you're running in like PowerShell script in C sharp inside a, a host, um, then you, then yeah, it will do that. But that's okay because typically all your scripts are going to do that anyway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So and then this one, this one loads some C sharp codes. Use the beautiful one of the, the most awesome parts of PowerShell in that if you can't do it in PowerShell, you can do it in .NET. So you just load some .NET code in there, um, which is, this is the crazy part. It's kind of doing the same thing here, but for some reason, um, it's uh, like this one's just saying this is a policy for trusting all certificates, and this is the, the, the callback method that you execute when you want to check to see if it is, but anyway, something to keep in mind, and you can hit these on Google, like, these will be like the top two things you get back from Google, um, so you, know, you don't need to photo this or anything like that, um, but just, just so you know, when you start seeing errors like that, just that's something you need to do. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna get into the demo. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be showing you Meraki, uh, Meraki system. So Fiddler, bring this guy up. Oh man, why does it do that? Um, okay, so and what we're going to and I've got a I've already got a PowerShell script written out here. Um, we're not seeing it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that is weird. Uh, P. Oh, it's still on extend. Uh, oh, this is what happens when you reload Chrome while you're tracing everything. Okay. Ugh. Okay. All right. So I've got no more browsers open. I've only got um, this one. So I'm going to open up my script here, uh, and I'm going to... Just go in here and cheat and grab my things. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the steps inside here. Uh, you'll see this is a dodgy password because I intend to reset it as soon as the demo ends. Um, be too late for that. <laughs> oh no, you'll have gotten into my um, rather, well, cheeky uh, access point. To be honest, this stuff, I got this Meraki stuff for free when I was working at Cisco because they had just been bought and um, they needed to get rid of all of the, the stuff. So basically what I do, uh, you'll notice the network name is kind of weird. Um, I, as I said, I came from like a security background. So I wanted to teach all my neighbors a lesson to not connect to access points called free Wi-Fi. So whenever someone connected to my access point, they'd be redirected to a captive portal with a local copy of lemonparty.org. So <clears throat> that's why you see that and that's all I use this for, software for. So we're going to go to uh, users here, and we're going to see that these are my users, and what I intend to do is reset the password of guest user here. So I'll uh, go through there, but first I'm going to jump back to Fiddler here, and we'll be able to, oh wow, this thing's talking to a lot of, ah, no. Of course, of course, Fiddler crashes. It's in a demo. <laughs> uh, you may have the dialog box again. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so 
So what I've got here, we'll see that first thing in here, uh, we've got the login. So I've hit this page um, and we'll see that the, actually no, that was the second page. The first one was, oh, I was already on the page of course, so let me, I won't start again, but we we'll see here, this was a post. So originally we got through and get the headers. Actually, you know what, I'm going to clear this because I think we do need to do it properly. All right, so let's log out and log back in again. Okay, so now I'm going to hit this page straight up. There we go. So that's est establishing those things. I'm going to copy out my creds. Email. Login. Network-wide users. And then we'll have it there. So if we go up here, we have that initial call to, that's the get. So that's the login dot dashboard. And we'll see in this raw, this is what I usually use the raw because this one um, works well. So you can see we've got the, the full URI there. Um, Fiddle is free by the way, uh, free to download. Um, you can Google it there. In here you've got all of the things that your whole system is um, all the HTTP calls that your system is making, it's acting as a proxy um, between uh, your machine and anything on the internet. <clears throat> and you can get it to decrypt HTTPS stuff. Um, so, and this is what it's doing. You can see all of this stuff is HTTPS, um, but it's inserted a man in the middle certificate, so it's able to decrypt everything and, um, and show it there. The, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is why you shouldn't connect to free Wi-Fi access points. Um, so, so you can go in here and, and we'll see that the get, um, if we look at the response here in this bottom section, uh, let's see if I can make that bigger, we'll see that it's given me a you know, 200 OK and all of the headers uh, that I need. And there would have been a set cookies. Uh, no, it didn't send any cookies here. Uh, so that's going to be in the, oh, here we go. So there was already a cookie there. That's why I didn't do it. So then the next part was that post that I did. So that this is the um, <clears throat> this is the login step. So stage two. Um, now I can see the raw data there, uh, which is a little hard to see. But you can also go into uh, Web Forms tab here, where it's really useful. You can just see all of the data. And basically, what happens like to translate this to PowerShell? Um, there's one of two ways that we can do it. Uh, one way is you can just create a hash table um, that looks just like that and send that in the dash data parameter of the invoke web request. Uh, you can create an object that looks like that and send it in the dash data. It's pretty cool that dash data or a string of representation of JSON. Or one other way which I'm going to show which is I think underappreciated um, is the Could you zoom in a little? Sorry? Zoom in a little? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I can see it fine. Hmm. No, it's, it's yeah, you actually part need to maximize because yeah. you're part of Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Is that good? <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. So, so what we'll see in that, we've also, we've got as a, so if I go to this authentication part, I'll, oop, uh, this initial request part, We'll see that invoke. I've called invoke web. I will will be calling. I haven't actually done this, but I will be calling invoke web request here. Um, you can see base URL login dashboard. I've defined base URL there. So this is going to map to my thing here. So there's my URI login login. Well, actually, sorry, refer. So the first one was dashboard. That's the the receive one that I got. Session variable. The session variable in the first request is actually, you only define it in your first request and you give it a string um, because this is the name of the variable that is going to contain the session that has been started uh, by this. And you'll see that in the second request I send, I'm using web session instead, not session variable, web session, web sess, which is the, the string that I gave it here. And that's how you establish persistence between the, the calls that you're making to that site. Um, uh, so, so we're giving it just the, the, yeah, the first one's extremely simple. Um, now the request that I get back from that, it contains forms and it does a, a little bit of parsing here and it pulls out the forms that um, I need to send the post. So I can do forms zero or you can select the form based on if you want to give it some where strings and stuff. But 
I just did it simply here. I just go form zero dot fields email equals that and so on and so forth. So I do that for the fields I want to put in. Now the reason why I do it here is because if we switch back to Fiddler here, we'll be able to see in the web forms, <coughs> you'll see that there was actually the forms that I saw were only the password and email. And yet there were actually three other fields um, and they were hidden. So I could go in and I could make my hash table look like this, but then I would have to parse through the page and find this authenticity token. So that, that authenticity token you'll find is one of those things a lot of people like to do um, because of security. Uh, I think this, this present, prevents things like cross-site scripting where you just sort of post, uh, post random things. This means you have to have established a session to get in. You can't skip any steps. So they do that and you have to have a different auth token for each request, like for each sort of click through. Um, so I use this forms thing because that thing's automatically <laughs> populated in that form, in that forms thing. <clears throat> so it's, it's just going to push through the rest of the stuff that was populated by the request. So I only need to set the two that I'm changing and I send it through. You'll see there's a couple of other things in here that I've set now. I'm going to bring that to a new line. So the URI is changing. I got the URI out of there easily. So I just go to this raw view and I can see post, blah, so I know what the URI I need to send it to. <clears throat> um, give it my session method post, it's right up here, top line. Um, occasionally, uh, sites are version sensitive, so you have to give it a particular version of HTTP. Um, you can see that up here as well, um, but this one isn't, isn't version sensitive. Content type. Uh, you do have to tell it that a lot of uh, most REST APIs will use application JSON or application XML, but when you're doing things like this, uh, you have to use the form URL encoded. Once again, this is something that you can get easily from the Fiddler logs because it's just telling you everything that that the browser has done during this uh, this journey step. And the body login page dot forms zero, <coughs> which was what I was editing up here. So the body, this thing can be just about anything. It's pretty cool. Um, I discovered that accidentally. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so now that we've done that, uh, we're gonna move on to the, the next phase, which is object identification. So if we jump back here, we've already migrated through to the, the page that we want to find the object on. So we did that by clicking through. That was a, a step in here. So this was this click here after I'd authenticated, so get, this, 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 okay, cool. So in that request, I don't have to mimic that thing. I can just straight up, um, I don't have to actually hit the get. Well, actually I do in this case, because I need to do some identification, but if you don't need to do it, that's, that could be a skippable thing. But of course this get returns to me uh, a very non-friendly body. Look at all this nastiness right here. Um, it's pretty horrendous. So try. You need to. What you need to do is find the object you want to do to use in here. So I need to get the authenticity token. Uh, oh, you. Yeah. So I've just done a search there. Um, so I need to find the authenticity token for that page by page click through thing. So I did a search for that and I found it there. So I have to go and parse that out. But that's easy. That's nice and regexable. So I just use a little. Regex to find that. If I jump over to to this object ID, well, so first of all, yeah. So here I go. I formulate that that page I need to do to receive the list of users, um, and then I go through uh, and I get get that usual. Yeah. So I find the auth token. So I do that here. So I'm just doing dashboard dot forms where ID equals hidden download form. Yeah. <laughs> select expand property fields and then grab the authenticity token from there. So there's a bunch of different ways. That dot forms thing is a, is a real time saver, but it doesn't always, um, doesn't always work uh, in particular for this next part that I'll be doing. That one, um, it does, uh, the, the UI does this crazy little two stage uh, commit thing. So I'll show you here when I want to reset the password, I click on the user that I want, I click change, generate or whatever, I'm going to email the new password to the user, I'm going to update user. So the reason why I can't use that forms thing is because this button here, I have to click in order to persist that change. Not very API friendly as you can see. However, under the covers, 
it translates relatively easily. So this is the get configure guests. Uh, let's see, where's my uh, post? So it's, well, what is this com t connect thing? It is filling up my stuff. I'm just gonna delete that a bit. Okay, um, so, so I've got this one here, which that was a get. Okay, that was actually an API get, so you can ignore. Sometimes these things do additional gets when you hit the page. You can ignore that one. This one receives it, gives me back all of that, um, uh, that garbage that I was showing you before. And then this is the, that's the post request that I sent. <clears throat> so you can see when I clicked that save changes, it sent this message across. So it formulated this URI, which was that manage configure, which is what I did in, in the other one. And that's calling a method called update guests saying send emails true, which funnily enough actually does nothing. Um, <clears throat> there's another form field that actually determines whether or not you're sending an email. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's there. Um, so we can see the auth token that we identified from that page scrape um, is going to be sent as a header there. So that's why we needed to find that. Um, <clears throat> You've got all these, you don't actually have to set all of these. There's only like, you'll find out when you're like doing your tests, which ones you actually need. Uh, you just keep adding it. You add the obvious ones, like anything that starts with X, you'll have to add um, because those ones are implemented by the application uh, generally rather than web servers. Um, occasionally load balancers do that, but most of the time, if it starts with X, you'll need to specify it. You'll always need to specify content type. Um, <clears throat> then, yeah, well, the, the rest of them usually don't really matter, except, except encoding those ones um, sometimes. Uh, so yeah, so we posted to this. Now we can go in here and we can see the web forms. We've got a lot of fields in here that did not appear um, in our UI. You saw that there was a few fields in there, which was just the, the new password, the email address, <coughs> the tick box, send emails. But there's a bunch of other stuff that was hidden that we didn't see. Um, so we're like, okay, where did it get this information from? Uh, we don't know. So that's something we have to parse out. I'm not going to go too much into detail on that inside the script um, because the, that parsing was... Luckily, actually, they did... They've kept the object that I need in JSON inside the, uh, inside the file, but they've made it unreasonable. So I used some regexes to identify the the thing that I need and then I can do a convert from JSON to find the object that I that I need to get those extra fields from but I won't go too much into that because it's boring <clears throat> and very specific to this but needless to say I need to find additional parts of this which include things like the secret um, the uh, emails and is client VPN all of these kinds of things in there some of them I can hard code because they're always the same, so it's good to, to do that. So I am hard coding a few. And we can see that that was the new password that it sent. So, so all of this information I can very easily pull out of, of Fiddler and translate to PowerShell. So I've gotten that. Now I was talking about another form, another way of using that body um, field of invoke web request is um, just sending in a hash table. So that's what I'm gonna do in this instance because that, log, that forms thing doesn't work in this case. I'm gonna create a new hash table um, with all of the fields that were in Fiddler. <coughs> and I'm gonna manually populate them, hard code them in cases where it doesn't matter. Um, and I'm gonna put, put variables in there. So the account was the hidden thing that I found. <coughs> so I populate all of those. Network was a parameter. And today's password was something I generated at the top of the script. It's just a, um, just a little chunk of code that will generate a random password, so it's, it's nothing special there. Um, so I go in <coughs> and I create this form data based on what I captured in Fiddler. And then I have this headers hash table as well, because the things I was point, pointing out before, I identified that these four are the only actual headers that I need to send, the auth token, they're requested with um, the accept language and the encoding as well. 
Typically, you'll want to put, if you see in your request, you see an accept encoding gzip deflate, you want to put that in there anyway, because what that's saying is, I support these forms of compression, um, and that's <coughs> going to improve your performance. So if you, if, you don't, um, if you don't have those, it's going to send uncompressed. And, yeah. When you use invoke web request, does it automatically decompress that stuff for you before you see it? Yes, yes, it will. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, so, so you can do all that, so that's a, that's a good one to put in there. Um, yeah, so then I go and create, there's, there's my URI that I saw in Fiddler. Um, and, I, and then the, the last line is just invoke web request. You give it that URI, same session, important uh, post. Now I'm including the headers, which I previously didn't put in before. The content type, again, form encoded. Let's new line this. Um, and then the body form data. So, with, and, and that, so that's, that's pretty simple. It's just taking, taking the fields that we've captured and then I can run this script here. So, Meraki, and we'll be able to go in <coughs> and that has done all of the same things. So I'm able to go through, <coughs> yes, these are nice now. So I can see that that was my get. It looks a lot simpler than the, the browser because the browser adds a lot of stuff. My login, uh, that was my post. <coughs> so my um, authentication step. <coughs> uh, it's a 302, so that wasn't me. Um, and this was uh, when I'm just going in, uh, what have I got here? What was I doing? Uh, that was just a, a regular get to the, the network part. Here we go. This is the, the more useful part. Um, <coughs> this is getting my list of, of user accounts. And then this was um, making the request to change the password. So in, in those steps, I've replicated everything that I was doing through the browser uh, and enabled me to uh, replace this manual activity with an automated one. So you can see, I, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen that this is quite cringy and dirty hacky, but someone doesn't have to log into this every day now. Um, and we have a script to do it. Um, so, so it saves them five, ten minutes of their day. So, how do you know which uh, attributes you have to add? You said that you add them, you see what you miss, and then you add those. Uh, what so, what kind of errors do you get if you don't have all the, all that you need? You usually you'll get um, like internal server errors. So the the machine that you're posting the day that you, when you do the post, <coughs> it'll come back saying like five hundred or. 403 or four something something above um, 300 um, it'll be an error like that or above 400 so you'll, you'll get those and then um, you just keep adding in headers copying different bits and making sure like version the version one is a tricky one like that because most I'd say that 90% of web apps don't care about the HTTP versions um, but some of them do um, and that one that one's a tricky one um, but yeah, that's uh, so you just you just kind of find out you start you try and keep the headers as small as possible because otherwise you've got a lot a lot of junk in your script that you probably don't need. But the form fields you'll always need because the servers will typically spew out um, stuff if you don't give them everything that they're asking for. So form fields you always put put those things. But a lot of the time they're just static, or you can just parse them out relatively easily. Because remember, we're mimicking a browser activity. And the browser, if the browser can do it, chances aren't PowerShell can do it. The only times when that isn't the case, you've, most of the time when I can't automate stuff, it's usually now with banks. Um, <clears throat> because they put in a lot of security, which is good. I'm very happy about all this. So I used to do that. I used to automate that. <laughs> um, I had scripts that would go in and calculate how much I had owing on my credit card and then pay off a percentage of that so that I could just constantly maintain a, a flowing debt of how well, several thousand dollars that I never had to pay back because PowerShell would constantly calculate um, yeah, how much. But then they, they got secure and all of that stuff. And <laughs> they started to, to you know. So if, if people code specifically to stop you from doing this, um, then it can be very tricky if they add a lot of JavaScript. Because anyone who uses JavaScript to, um, because this, the JavaScript doesn't run. If they use JavaScript to populate the form fields or manipulate data that isn't there, especially if that JavaScript has to go and call some external entity or do something like that, 
that's when this isn't going to work. There's another way um, you can use the Internet Explorer com object to automate that, which is the dirtiest of all hacks, <laughs> but it does work. Um, and sometimes I have had to automate stuff using that. And in PowerShell v5, it's not painfully slow anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, they sped up com object access like hugely. Now. Wow. I thought of all the things they were going to invest in improving com yeah. Internet Explorer yeah. com object. Well, they're just common challenges. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Oh, that's good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, didn't see much value in improving IE com. But anyway, it's, uh, that's good news. Um, but I, I tend, these ones are orders of magnitude faster than Internet Explorer. It, it will take just as long to open Internet Explorer as this entire script took to run. So, yeah. And an alternative to that could be to create a Windows scripting home object and run your JavaScript in there, but that's also quite weird. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, I haven't looked sort of that deep into it. Generally, I give up as soon as I see that they're using JavaScript um, because <laughs> By the time it get, we have to do that, you start to question like, how much time is this going to take me to automate versus how much time is it going to take that guy to do it manually. Um, <coughs> and the value proposition often decreases there. So, yeah. How many things do you need Fiddler to actually have a partial project? I have not. Um, Fiddler, is, Fiddler is amazing. Um, I have done, what I've shown you here is about like a quarter of a percent of what Fiddler can do. Um, this is all I ever use it for, so this is pretty much all I know how to do in Fiddler. But it can actually do a lot of really cool things in there. Um, yeah, I think you could like, create a parser that would output the, your web requests right in the screen. And you just pick yeah. Device. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, you know, a lot of people actually do that. Like, I don't know if anyone here has used Cisco's UCS. Um, well, they have, they have some amazing PowerShell integration dare I say better than exchange because um, basically like, you don't need to write that PowerShell script you open the GUI and you click things and change things so you, they've got one, one commandlet is the only commandlet you actually need to know you type um, start UCS session or something um, and it lo launches the, I, the interface you click through and it just like all of the clicks it records and translates to PowerShell scripts so you can just uh, yeah it's it looks like the IIS ones, which because everything's changed, it's like get this object, pipe it to this, get pipe it to this, pipe it to this, but it doesn't really matter because you're, you don't ever actually have to maintain those scripts. You just need to write them. You record them. So anyway, no more UCS pitches. I don't work for Cisco anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so this is, um, this is uh, hopefully been relatively useful. I seem to have finished um, 10 minutes early. Um, so I can probably go into um, some of those other things uh, that I wanted to to talk about that I didn't. I had a question about yeah? except encoding. You said that you should specify that. Uh, if you yeah, if you well, it's I mean it's it doesn't hurt you if you don't. Um, it might be slightly slower performance. But, but even like uh, when you just say low web request, if you don't say except encoding, you mean you won't get the except version. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure what it does under the covers. Um, it might or might not. Um, all I know is that if you do specify it, then it will. So, um, it's and it's it's one of those hidden things that you kind of have to. Um, I've I've never actually looked at it, to be honest. Um, should be easy to just see the. Yeah, the should be easy enough. Uh, well, let's see. Here I did a get and I didn't specify it, so no, it doesn't. There we go. <laughs> I didn't specify headers here, so. Um, that would be a good uh, bug report, I think. I mean, or suggestion, but well, if, if invoke web request will deflate stuff automatically for you, it may as well just put that in the header. So button. it's, yeah, so it's not actually invoke web request that does it. It's the .NET frame stack underneath it mm -hmm. that does it. Um, so it's, um, so it's not gonna, it's not really something that, that invoke web request should be aware of. Um, because some servers support it, some don't. Um, so you can't just put on a, like the default of having it on would that could then lead to things breaking. So um, you kind of have to leave it off and then specify it. It's just one of those things like a, a caching, caching flag or whatever. So um, that is another thing that's actually very useful with um, being able to add headers is you can bypass caches. Um, so you can say like cache control, no cache, so that way it'll get it every time so you, you can ensure, if you're doing like um, web debugging, 
Um, the reason why I started getting into this in the first place was because <clears throat> we, uh, I was working at an online auction company that, um, um, uh, well, we had like 20 or 30 web servers that we needed to automate. And we had a lot of trouble. Like, if we started seeing a lot of 500 errors, uh, we saw them in the logs, but we were like, well, is that happening on all servers or only on some servers for that particular user journey? So, so I started scripting out all of our most common user journeys, which were like, um, find an item, um, put it in your shopping cart and buy it and things like that. So we, fact we added a one cent item. And so we were able to run these, these user journeys and spread them out because we could also specify the host. So you can see there, that's put in there by default. We didn't put that in there, but you can actually put that in there. And then you can, um, so in the, the load balancer, it'll go straight to that, that host. So, sorry, you, you give it instead of this, so that'll be the load balancer address that you give it. Um, sorry, sorry, other way around. You give it the direct server name, not the load balancer. And you put the host as the load balanced address. Um, and so that way you're guaranteed to hit a particular server, but the host headers uh, in the web request, so for SSL and stuff like that, it only looks at this. So it's going to, um, so you can basically bypass the load balancer and hit one. So if you want to run, run a, a user journey on 30 servers individually at the same time, you can do that by just hitting it in the URL there and setting the host to the load balance address. So you can send out that, that user journey, run it through, put it through the cart, um, and check that out and return it all. And each one you can, you can do times, so the user stopwatch or something, and you can record how long each step <coughs> takes recording that, putting that information into a database. So then you can use that in performance analysis saying, okay, after this deployment, um, it's now, this user journey is now taking an additional three seconds. Okay, look, look at the steps in that journey. This, this step here is now taking an additional 2.5 seconds. All right, so why is that? What, have we, what changes have we made in this last deployment? Ah, okay, so someone's, someone's querying that view in the database, which they shouldn't be because it doesn't have an index. So you're able to kind of very quickly identify problems that you wouldn't otherwise have visibility of. Yeah? Uh, just a little bit earlier, you had mentioned that some, um, some requests are HTTP version sensitive. Do you mm -hmm. have an example of how you would specify that? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's a header. Um, so that's like a, you could do that just here. So you go, uh, actually, no, I think it's, I don't think it's a header, I think it might be a, let's see if it's here. Um, uh, it's not in here. Uh, okay, so it's not in here. So a lot of a lot of the common headers are um, <clears throat> are, are put in here as commandlets. So like user agent as a header, uh, maximum redirection, transfer encoding. These are all headers. So they're well they're they're implemented as headers in HTTP, but in .NET underneath their separate properties. Um, <clears throat> so what you do here is if you wanted to do it, I think it's HTTP version equals 1.1 although every all headers have to be strings and they don't support dashes so you'd have to do something like this um, there so so that would um, do that would specify the HTTP version in that header um, <clears throat> now most uh, I'm, I'm gonna say the only times I've ever encountered the version issues is using Cisco products <laughs> I can say that now because I'm not an employee um, <laughs> So yeah, the, um, <clears throat> if you're trying to automate a Cisco product, then be wary of the, the version header because you need to then special. So by default, I think it uses the 1.1. Um, <clears throat> um, but yeah, sometimes you have to manually specify 1.0 because they don't, the, the di main difference <clears throat> in terms of these interactions is just the, um, the, accept, the accept header, I think. Um, so it's, uh, getting into low level details of HTTP that I'm not entirely certain about, but I think it's just a, a way you can kind of pre-check something before actually sending content um, just to make sure that it's ready before you post the data. I think that's the main difference for the for that one there, that accepts thing. So, yeah, okay. So, um, let's see, what was it? I'm getting getting kind of close, so I don't actually really have time. Does anyone have any more questions on this, or like other authentication mechanisms like OpenAuth and? Well, OpenAuth. So you'll see um, those those ones are typically you'll you'll implement. Um, usually, you can use the invoke rest method for those ones because OpenAuth is is going to give you JSON back. 
Um, <clears throat> so when you when you hit that, you'll typically um, get um, you you hit a rest endpoint. You give it the credentials that you need, and then it'll give you back a token which you can parse out of the. So using invoke rest method, it'll automatically convert it to an object for you, and you'll have that, and then you'll stick that in a header. Um, so that's what um, so Active Directory authentication works like the the same way. I think that uses OpenAuth. Um, the ADAL stuff, but um, you you just give it a bunch of information that you send in the post request to the, the website, and then, then you authenticate using headers there. So like this auth token, it would be like that. It's usually, I think, um, so it's authorizer, in, in Azure it's authorization um, equals bearer, the, something like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's what your auth token, that's how you're going to um, authenticate with stuff if you're using like Azure Resource Manager or things like that or, or anything that uses Active Directory auth for that matter um, that's how you're going to interact with with that particular one um, you might have um, no different apps implement those headers differently the, the authorization he header is a generic HTTP header like a large authenticate header based authentication scheme is, is implemented this way so almost no matter what you use like auth or open ID or NTL info Right, right. Yeah, so but you, only, yeah, you only have to do it if, if that's the kind of or they use. But for forms-based authentication, you, you don't have... If they're using cookies, so in this case, they store the equivalent of that in the cookie. So whenever you're sending that, they're sending the cookie value. Um, but here, in this case, you're skipping that. You're not actually storing it in a cookie, which is actually more secure to do it this way because if you're storing it in a cookie, then other things can access that cookie. Um, so your you know, your slight slight risk there. Um, this one this one's actually a lot easier to automate too. Uh, I much prefer using this way. That's why most of the time this is how REST implementations implement it, because you just go get it, <clears throat> and then you can just all you have to do is um, you can cache that and reuse that for its timeout period. So um, it's a lot it's a lot nicer than using cookies, especially because cookies aren't. Um, <clears throat> Well, you, you can't share them across the machine at all, so, uh, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, it's button pushing time. Push, push. Push, oh, okay. And here we go.